All right, we are going to go back and revisit and finish up the address book application. Um, this one was significant because it was the first case that we had in this class of database interactivity. And we we'd mentioned that um, databases really are, are one of the ways that you can have some sort of persistence in an application. That is, have it remember stuff that happened before. Um, the first that we looked at in this class were, were, were using shared preferences. All right, shared preferences are essentially ordered pairs, that there is a, a key and a value. Sometimes those are called uh, hash uh, tables. Um, and that's one way. That is generally only good for sort of simple data. You know, um, If you remember, we used it in the one example to, to remember um, our Twitter searches. And we also used it in the one homework assignment to remember the results of rock, paper, scissors. But for anything more involved, you've got to take a different technique. Um, one of the options um, I mentioned were just using plain old sequential files. And while there's a place for everything and, and there's potential that, that that might work well in a given application, Generally speaking, if it was too involved or too complex to be recorded in the shared preferences, I'd probably jump over files and go right to uh, a SQL-like database. And that's what we did for this assignment. It, it certainly would be possible to create um, this application using sequential files uh, as opposed to uh, a relational database. But, you know, I'm not sure for the extra flexibility and for the extra uh, features and, and power that you get with the database, I'm not sure it would be worth it to um, implement this via a sequential file. Last, of course, would be storing somehow in the cloud. And that typically would involve a database as well, but the database would not live on your device. It would live on, um, on a web server somewhere. And you would simply make requests, essentially like posting form data to an application in ASP.NET. And we're not really going to talk about that either because really not too much exciting would happen on the client side. Most of the work would happen on the server side. But we are going to uh, look at databases in this example. Now this example, besides being a good database example, is a good example of the object oriented concept of encapsulation. And what that concept relates to is everything that belongs together is in one place. Everything that is logically connected is in one place. Now, depending on the kinds of application you're developing, that can mean a bunch of different things. Typically, apps that you develop for uh, a device are not necessarily going to be these gigantic enterprise-level applications that um, where, where you know where a lot of things are integrated and so on and so forth. They're tending to, they're, they're tending to be small, focused on one sort of thing. So your object-oriented design might be a little bit different in this context than it might be in other contexts. But where it where, where the similarities are is that good design uh, of these classes, good design of these objects, will follow good object-oriented principles, one of which is encapsulation. That is, everything that belongs together is put in the same class. And in this case, the real good example of this is this database connection class database connector class. And we looked at it last time, and we'll just spend a minute reviewing um, some of the capabilities that it performs. Then we'll go in and we'll look at um, possibly expanding uh, expanding uh, this. All right. This database class really is responsible for all the interaction with the database. So, in other words, 
there is a connection to the database. All right, the SQLite database. So we connect to the database through this through this class. We open the database, we connect to it, we close it when we're done. We do our inserts, we do our updates, we get a list of contacts, we get one contact, and we delete a contact. Finally, we have some code in here that occurs when we create this for the first time. All that is encapsulated in one place. So if we were to decide to convert this to a cloud-based application, we wouldn't have to go in and look for stuff in a bunch of other places. All the stuff relating to the database would be here. Or if we would, say, decide to make a sequential file version of this, which is unlikely, but if we were, all of that data management occurs in this class. So we could, we could uh, uh, do that. One thing that you might have is you might have, and, and this gets a little more involved, but you could also include that here as well, is have some sort of syncing between a server and uh, a handheld device. You know, I have an application with a task list that I maintain, and it stores my tasks and to-dos locally on my phone, but it also syncs it up to a web server, all right? It syncs it up uh, to the cloud. Now, that way, if I'm not, uh, if I don't have an internet connection, I can still go and enter a task. You know, let's say I'm, you know, somewhere and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm not getting a good internet connection for whatever reason. Um, if it was entirely based on, um, if it was entirely based on uh, storing the data in the cloud, I'd be out of luck. I wouldn't be able to enter that in. But because there's a mix of um, a local component and a cloud component, um, I am able to add, uh, to add it in. And if it's not able to sync up with the cloud immediately, it will shortly after. Now. When you talk about syncing two different entities like that, there's a potential for complexity. Not so much with a single user, but if you have a multiple user application. Now something like a contact list or a, 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 a to-do list is, is likely to be just a single user. All right, so you're gonna have less issue with that. But for example, let's say I edit a task both on the desktop version of the application and in the handheld to have different due dates. So I put in a, a task of wash the car and I change the due date on my handheld to one date and I change the due date uh, on, the, on the web through the web interface to the cloud to another date. Which one of those takes precedence? Well, you could probably come up with some very easy rules. All right, You could probably define in that case with a single user that whichever update happened last is probably the one that we want to stick. But in other more involved multiple user uh, sort of syncing situations, you don't have that problem. Or, or you do have that problem, I mean, I'm sorry. Now, again, this is sort of beyond this particular application, but my point being is that because all of this is encapsulated, if we need to make a change somehow about the manner in which it stores, we have one place to go to uh, and to do that. All right. Okay. If I remember last time, I think we looked at the initial load of this to get a list and display a list of contacts that were previously entered.
In other words, when we fired up the application, what do we get? We get a list of our contacts. When we tap the contact, we can then go in and edit it. Or I'm sorry, first we can view it, then we can either edit or delete it. Or, from the list we can press the menu and add a new contact. So what we're going to do today is look at those um, three functionalities. The clicking on it to take us into view mode, from the view mode, the edit and update, and then the insert. If you recall from last time, we created the list by creating a, um, a list view and we associated an adapter of our contacts, this contact adapter, um, with it which effectively populates that list. We also set the on-click listener to, uh, for that contact list to view the contact. So we set the listener to be the view contact listener object. If we look at the view contact listener object, It has an on-click event that allows us to fire up another activity to actually do the viewing. This was one of the other things that was distinct about this, about this uh, particular um, example, is that this example involves multiple activities. Um, we may have seen, uh, I, I think we did see an example of multiple activities with the, the Twitter example. And I know with the camera example that I tried to get to work, uh, we saw multiple activities. But here's another case of creating another intent. to a screen that the user has to fill out. 
It's something for the user to do. Something for the user to look at, something for the user to do. So in other words, when I click on a contact and that screen pops up, all right, that's a new activity. All right. How do I get to the previous activity? If I press the back button on the, the device, I go back to the previous activity. Of course, we have to tell it which row got clicked. So we do that when we create this intent, view contact, we use this put extra data to put the contact's row ID as sort of an extra thing that we're going to pass to that intent. So when we create an intent, we can pass to it some information. And we pass that information through that put extra. So what we're passing to that new intent, that new activity, is the row of the guy that got clicked. And then we specify that we want to start that activity. We can also specify then a function that we want to call when this activity terminates. There's nothing we really need to do in this case. But if you remember in our camera example, there was a function that I called when the camera activity finished. All right. so. Getting back to this, I click on the person on the list. This on click, on item click method of the click listener fires off, creates a new intent, uses that extra, that that activity dot extra or put extra to pass data to the activity. In our case, it is the row that we clicked on, so it can pull it up. This view activity then fires off. It does what most of our activities have done, that is, it initializes. It goes and grabs pointers to the different items on the screen. It then pulls off that extra parameter, that, that area that we use to pass information to this activity. It then pulls the row ID off of it. Right? Because we don't just want to display any contact or the first contact or, or whatever. We want to display the specific con uh, contact that was clicked on. And what are we going to do? We're going to go and we're going to load that contact using the row ID. Now, how do we load that contact? Well, we leave that up to our database object. We create a new instance of our database connector object. We call the get one contact method on it, which does a retrieve. And we pass it the parameter, that is, we pass it the row ID, or the contact ID, of the person that we want. After that executes, we go and we grab the first item in our cursor. Remember, what's a cursor? A cursor is like a list of items that gets pulled from something, a result set that has a list of items. In this case, because we're only pulling up the one specific contact, that is the contact that we clicked on, we know we're only getting one back. We're not getting back two. So we don't really need a loop. We can simply grab the first person off that list, get their name, phone number, and so on, and then set our controls on the view to this.
So when we're done, the controls on that view are populated with the data from the cursor, which is the data that came from the database. Here we have our menu to um, edit or delete that item. And we'll stop here for a second. We'll come back to this. Any questions up till now? So let's review what happens object by object. One thing that's sometimes done, and, and I would encourage you to, um, to diagram this. It, it can help you understand. Let, let me show you what I mean uh, in a second. I've even heard cases where people role play this. In other words, they will have a different person in a design walkthrough, take the role of one of the classes, and if you want to call a method on a class, you would talk to that person and say, you know, give me one contact. And then they do their thing and they give you one back. And, and that way you sort of personify them and you can see how they talk to each other. In this case, what I'm going to do is, um, I'm going to, uh, sometimes these things are called use cases. In other words, how something gets processed. All right? And it's interesting because this has implications as far as design goes, as far as testing goes, and so on and so on and so forth. All right? So let's look at a use case for here and let's draw some diagrams. Those of you that have taken or, or are taking the systems development class, you know, they have data flow diagrams. They have a lot of different diagrams that sort of address this, depending on, uh, and, and these largely vary only sort of in, in the style of how they're done or what they're trying to capture. But I think it's important for us to know how the classes work together in this. So, we have our list. We have our on-click listener. We have our view activity. We have our view GUI, which is in an XML file. We have our database object. We're going to start at the point where we have our list of contacts. All right. click listener was assigned to this list that says when you get clicked this is a person that springs to duty all right so let's follow this through all right I click on this this guy springs to duty all right this guy says hey I got clicked I need to initiate The view activity. All right. For the view activity to work, I have to pass the row number of who got clicked. And I do that through that extras field, extras property. So I go and initiate this activity, and I pass along with it the row ID of who got clicked. This row ID, this view activity.
activity. What does it do? And again, our manifest says that when you click on this, the view activity I'm interested in isn't some other view activity out there, but it's a view activity within this application. So, what does a view activity do when it fires up? And again, I'm, I'm sort of editing out, only hitting the most important things, but one thing it does is it inflates the GUI. It grabs pointers to the elements on the GUI. It then asks the database object to retrieve the selected contact. How does it know which is the selected? It got passed, the row ID. So it's going to pass this guy the row ID. This guy's going to do its thing. And it's going to return a cursor, which is effectively a list. Now we know something special about this list in this particular case. We know this list only contains one contact. So I'm sending back this list that only contains one contact, by definition, because I know I'm only clicking on one of those. I'm not clicking on two of them or anything like that. So I'm sending back this list of contacts, which I know is only going to contain one. I grab the first item off that list, which, of course, is the only item on the list. I then pull the attributes and put in the GUI. The only thing I didn't draw was that. So that's the flow how these activities work and how they talk to each other. The on-click listener's job is to invoke the activity, and to pass which row got clicked. The view activity's job is to inflate the GUI, get pointers to the different things on the GUI, ask the database object to pull the selected contact, take the result, and pop them in that GUI. It's GUI. The database object's job is to retrieve the one single contact and return it back to be display. So let's look at this again now that we've gone through this code. All right, here we are. We're looking at the on-click listener associated with the contact list. When it's clicked, what's it doing? It's starting up the intent. It's grabbing and passing the row ID as part of that extra data. And then it initiates that activity. The view contact activity inflates 